আসসালামু আলাইকুম ওয়া রাহমাতুল্লাহি ওয়া বারাকাতুহু এভরিওয়ান এন্ড ওয়েলকাম ব্যাক টু অ্যানাদার এপিসোড অফ দ্য ইসলামিক কলিং পডকাস্ট আই এম ব্যাক ওয়েলকাম ব্যাক আই নো इट्स अ শক আই অ্যাকচুয়ালি ডিডন্ট থিংক আই উড বি এবল টু মেক দিস ভিডিও দিস মান্থ বাট আলহামদুলিল্লাহ আই হ্যাভ বিন এবল টু ফিক্স মাই পিসি সো ইন কেস ইউ গাইস ডিডন্ট নো মাই পিসি কমপ্লিটলি ব্রোক ডাউন দ্য পাওয়ার সাপ্লাই ওয়াজ নট ওয়ার্কিং সো আই টু ফিক্স ইট বাট আলহামদুলিল্লাহ আই বিন এবল টু ফিক্স ইট সো ইয়া আই হ্যাভ নাও আই এম ব্যাক ইয়েস So yeah um today I will be responding to a certain individual uh, a YouTuber uh, by the name of Vertizium. So in case you guys don't know a Vertizium is a, a kind of like a pop uh, science YouTuber. He is basically a science popularizer. He makes like uh, videos based on science. He have a promotes kind of like scientism. He has been promoting uh, evolution and just like Neil deGrasse Tyson uh he's also promoting certain uh kind of like nihilistic agnostic ideas and as you know those ideas are very bad <laughs> so inshallah the, in this video i'll be responding to one of his videos that i found quite problematic so let's take a look at one of his video by the so basically he made a video on a long running evolution experiment that was done and uh, let's see what uh, he says and then I'll make my response these are bacteria growing into increasingly concentrated antibiotics the bacteria stop growing when they hit the first antibiotic strip but then a mutant appears capable of surviving in the antibiotic then another mutation occurs and now the bacteria can survive 10 times the concentration then 100 times And finally after just 11 days of evolution these bacteria can survive antibiotics a thousand times stronger than what would have killed them at the start you're watching evolution in action did you catch that little language he used he makes it sound like as if like this bacteria is just going around and just gaining gaining like this new abilities like as if like they're being they're like superpowers and they're getting this like magical abilities and becoming stronger and stronger right or at least that's the narrative unfortunately for for him that's not exactly what's happening so basically what the experiment did is that all it showed is that you know bacteria can use the abilities that they already have that's it <laughs> it's not like they kind of like gain some kind of new ability so basically in case you guys don't know bac- bacteria can actually eat a lot of things or can survive in a very different type of environments so in order for them to survive what they do is they often times turn off some of their other functions uh because they don't need them and when like a, a a different situation comes they simply just turn on that function so in 2016 a peer reviewed study in the journal of bacteriology rapid evolution of citation utilization by uh ex uh ex Terikia coli by direct selection requires a CT uh, and DCT A uh, co-authored by Van uh, Hofwagen and biologist Scott Minich and Carol uh, Caroline uh, Howard uh, so basically they did this kind of like uh, study and they also did their own experiment as well which basically debunked this whole experiment so basically there's an article on evolution news which says the following a mutation allowed the e coli to express an anti proto protein uh, ct under oxygen conditions ct permits one molecule of uh, citrate to be imported into the cell in exchange for one uh, three less valuable molecules with less carbon succinct so forming uh, tumoret or malady uh, however the gene for this anti proto protein already existed previously no new gene evolved ct is usually uh, switched off in e coli when oxygen is present but this mutation allowed it to be turned on uh, what caused it to turn on a microbe is making a switch that normally represses expression of the gene that produces ct under oxygen conditions and was broken uh, via a mutation that factored a new promoter so the factory uptake pathway that turned on under oxygen conditions this is the evolution of new molecular feature is the breaking of the molecular feature the repressor switch there was a duplicate uh, mutation of the gene for the ct and the proto protein allowing the bacteria to produce more of that protein this allowed the bacteria to uptake more factor under oxygen conditions and this should not be the evolution of anything new it only involves making more of something already present another mutation uh, occurred for the gene that produces uh, protein and uh, dct 
here. The succeeding problem is allowed some of the substrate uh, that can uh, be lost in exchange for nitrate to be recovered and transported back into the cell. In addition, of making a more, in addition to making a more of something already present, not new, not something that uh, became new. That's the major pathway involved. One, making something at a molecular level, uh, and after two, making uh, more of something already present, uh, such as the and three, making more of something already present, which is another thing which is something uh, important. Making creature at a molecular level or making more of something pre-existing, uh, some of uh, the pre-existing components, has been long known under uh, the Darwinian evolution uh, mechanism. As Minich and his co-authors explain in their paper, no new genetic information, novel gene function evolved. So basically. All that happened is that uh, the the bacteria did something that they could always do. That's it. <laughs> it's like when you go and um, go in a, go into a, like a dark tunnel, and you stay there for a while, and you start to see things in in the darkness, right? And we humans can do that, right? So when we can do that, it's not like we're gaining some kind of new superpower. <laughs> to see in darkness. No, it's just something that we always had. We always had this ability. Even if we didn't go into that dark area, we would still have this ability, right? It's not something new that we discovered. Same thing with this uh, bacteria. They already have this ability uh, to, you know, survive in these different conditions. And that's all that happened. <laughs> it's not like some kind of new magical ability that they gained. But regardless, let's see what else said. This is Richard Lenski. He started the experiment 33 years ago. And along with a team of colleagues, he has kept it going, even on weekends, ever since. In this lab are 12 flasks of live E. coli bacteria. They are the lucky few, the ones that have survived over three decades of evolution in a lab. So there are 12 long-term lines. In 1988, a single common ancestor spawned these 12 separate populations, and ever since that day, they have been growing and dividing independently. So how have they evolved? There are other long-running evolution experiments, like since 1896, scientists at the University of Illinois have selectively bred corn, but they get only one generation per year, whereas these bacteria go through six or seven generations a day. So after 33 years, the bacteria in these flasks are generation 74,500. If those were human generations, it would represent 1.5 million years of hominid evolution. <laughs> what? Oh my god. Okay. Uh, that was dumb. <laughs> That was incredibly dumb. Okay, so here he's coming. Here's Verticium, is committing what is known as the faulty comparison fallacy. So basically, he's trying to compare two different things that has nothing to do with each other. The so-called human evolution uh, that he's trying to describe, and he shows picture of like <laughs> a monkey turning into a human. First of all, that never happened. There's no evidence that that ever happened. Uh, but even if for the sake of argument I said that that happened, you still can compare that with what's happening with the bacteria in this lab. <laughs> okay, This bacteria, this E. coli, are not turning into some kind of cat or, or some kind of other thing. Okay, <laughs> the, 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 the comparison makes no sense. The bacteria are still bacteria. As a matter of fact, nothing changed, like no, nothing new uh, came into uh, this uh, this bacteria. But how do you... The lab environment is very different from the one the bacteria are used to. It's much simpler, there are no other organisms present, they're kept at 37 degrees Celsius, and they live in the same solution, a mixture including glucose, potassium phosphate, citrate, and a few other things. Their only carbon source is glucose, which is limited. And it's a good thing he did, because in 2003, the bacteria started doing something remarkable. One of the 12 lineages suddenly began to consume a second carbon source, citrate, which had been present in our medium throughout the experiment. It's in the medium as what's called a chelating agent to bind metals uh, in the medium. But E. coli, going back to its original definition as a species, is incapable of that. 
But one day we found one of our flasks had more turbidity. I thought we probably had a contaminant in there. Some bacterium had gotten in there that could eat the citrate and therefore had, had raised the turbidity. Uh, we, we went back into the freezer and restarted evolution. We also started checking those bacteria to see whether they really were E. coli. Yep, they were E. coli. Were they really E. coli that had come from the ancestral strain? Yep. So we started doing genetics on it. It was very clear that one of our bacteria lineages had essentially, I like to say, sort of woke up one day, eaten the glucose, and unlike any of the other lineages, discovered that there was this nice lemony dessert, and they'd begun consuming that and getting a second source of carbon and energy. Okay, so this is either a mistake, which I really hope it is, or a straight up lie. I'm going to assume that it's a mistake because Islam teaches me to assume the best of people. However, it is a serious mistake that needs to be corrected. E. coli is not in any way, shape or form incapable of eating citrate. E. coli has always been able to you know, eat citrate. Uh, they have always been able to do that. Uh, here I'll play, actually play an audio excerpt of Dr. Von Hofwagen. And this is an interview where he said that E. coli has always been able to do that. <laughs> it's just that their ability to do that was turned off then under the right condition, it was turned on. And this is not some new evolutionary ability that they gained. Here, take a look. This is Bob Holmes, and this was in the major journal New Scientist. He said, a major evolutionary innovation has unfurled right in front of researchers' eyes. It's the first time evolution has been caught in the act of making such a rare and complex new trait. And, and as you said, <laughs> what, when, it, when that happened, it was interesting, but you you point out in, in your talk, and you're not the only one, I mean, Michael B. Has, has, has made this point, but I think it's worth making again. It's not quite as shocking as initially billed. And you got very specific about it. And uh, can you explain a little bit, even before your own research, experimental sure. results, which we'll get into a minute, why is it not, not quite as big a deal as build? Exactly. Yeah. So the, of course, that quote I pulled out just to show like how influential and how impactful this experiment was seen because yeah, organisms growing on an entire new nutrient is incredibly interesting from an evolutionary perspective. But when microbiologists look at an experiment like that, we know that E. coli does have the ability to grow on citrate. It's used in various metabolic cycles and they have the ability to, to use it in those, what we call the citric acid cycle. And if they get it into the cell, it's used in their metabolic processes. The only difference is that in the conditions of the experiment, they didn't have a transporter. They didn't have the ability to bring the, the citrate out outside of their, their, their cells into the cells and actually start to use it for energy. Um, and so when I looked at that experiment as a microbiologist, I thought, well, all they have to do is turn that thing on. Um, that's really easy for bacteria to do. Why did it take them 33,000 generations to do that? Um, and so that- So let me pause here. Sir. So it'd be, and tell me if this il illustration is completely off base. It'd be a little like a, you know, a room and all of a sudden a light comes on after a few years and you're like, oh, amazing. The room developed this ability. And you're like, and you're like it looks like a mouse or something bumped a light switch because it already had the capacity to have light. It was there. It just exactly. needed something to switch it on. Exactly. And, and the E. coli in these experiments, they have that light switch. It's just yeah. in the conditions of the experiment with oxygen present, that light switch is turned off. So what makes them turn the light switch on? Well, usually it's the absence of oxygen. Mm -hmm. But in his experiment, there is no oxygen, so the light switch would stay down. So what did they do? Did they did they break the light switch, or did they give it a new light switch? Like what's the, what's what's the experiment yeah. um, to do that with? And so then, so just at a kind of analysis level, you knew that they were overblowing it. But then you went in and did some of your own experimental research. I did. Um, and that eventually got published, am I correct, in the Journal of Bacteriology, that work? We did, yeah. yeah. I was working in the lab of Dr. Uh, Scott Minnick at the mm -hmm. University of Idaho when I was doing my doctoral work. And we saw that experiment. We saw an opportunity to say, 
that, wait a minute, there's a way for the organisms to do this if we put them in a situation where they are stressed enough that they can do that. And if we put them in that situation, would they do it in a time frame much less than 33,000 generations? And when we did the experiment, it turns out that they did. And they did it every time we did the experiment. They did, I, I think I isolated 46 times that they did it. And they usually did it in less than 100 generations when we put them in a condition that said, all right, grow on this or you're not going to grow anymore. And they did it repeatedly almost every time we did the experiment. They did it. Now, this, to me, that's, that strikes me. And I'm just coming at this as a, a layman who's kind of studied this, not with a PhD in biology, but it strikes me as, you know, when Linsky, it happened in Linsky's lab, it was after, you know, thousands and thousands of generations. So you could kind of plausibly imagine all those generations, all the all the, the big popula relatively big population size, you know, compared to mm -hmm. mammals. And wow, we finally got lucky, just like you know, Darwinism says, if you have a big enough population, you have enough generations. But then when it happens in a hundred generations, when it just do or die, then you're like, that probably wasn't random chance achieving long odds because it had enough tries. There's something else going on here, which seems to kind of I won't say kind of, it seems to strongly support your presupposition that it was just more of a switch that just needed to be. Exactly. Yeah. We looked at the system as if it was, it had the ability to, to alter their response. So as you guys can see, uh, E. coli always had the ability to do that. Uh, Dr. Vaughn says the same in his paper. He said, E. coli cannot use citrate uh, aerob aerobically. Long-term evolution experiment LTE performed by Blount uh, et al., Z. E. Blount and Z. E. Barrick, uh, C. D. Davidson and R. E. Uh, in Nature found a single aerobatic site uh, utilizing E. coli strain after 23,000 generations, which is like 15 years. This was interpreted as a speciation event, which means that they think that this uh, created a new species. Here we show why it probably was not a speciation event. And in this experiment, they prove that that's not the case. Using similar media, 46 independent uh, site uh, utilizing mutants uh, were isol isolated uh, in as few as 12 to 100 generations. A genomic and uh, DNA sequencing uh, revealed an amplification of the CT and DCTA loci and DNA arrangement, rearrangement to capture and uh, we capture a promoter to express CT arbically. Uh, these are members of the same class of mutation identified by the LTE. We conclude that the rarity of the LTE mutant was an artifact of the experiment conditions and not unique, uh, not a unique evolutionary event. No, gen no new genetic information of LTE function evolved. So as you guys can see, when Lenski says that E. coli uh, as a species does not have the ability, that is wrong. E. coli always had the ability to, you know, eat citrate. <laughs> And they, they do have this in their gene. So the, evol so the experiment actually doesn't prove anything. <laughs> it definitely doesn't prove evolution. I mean, so, okay, so the, the reason I'm making this video. So the whole reason I'm making this video is because I've actually seen this experiment being used in an argument against uh, theism. And unfortunately, I had this one kind of like naive atheist. He was kind of using this experiment to kind of like prove that you know evolution is real blah blah now there's a few problems with this first of all even if for the sake of argument i ignore all these problems and say that you know what fine no problem this is true you know this experiment proved that speciation happened so what <laughs> like no one denies that microevolution happens like yeah it does like we can see it happening even if, if this one is not a good example that it does happen right so no one's denying it. Even the most hardcore creationists, which I'm not a creationist by the way, but even the most hardcore creationists, even they don't deny microevolution. <laughs> they don't have an issue with microevolution. The issue with evolution is the macroevolution. And not just the macroevolution, is the, the claim that macroevolution happened for all species. That is an unfalsifiable claim that has never been proven and will very likely not ever be proven because it's impossible <laughs> we don't have all species and we don't even know about all species so that's a very big claim and so far there's nothing that says that this claim is true even if it's true for some some species so we have no reason to accept this either way and this experiment doesn't prove macroevolution anyway so yeah using this in argument does not do you any favors atheists uh, all it does is that make you look stupid <coughs> because that it, this experiment itself is not a very good one as I just showed. 
So with this, I want to end the video. Again, thank you guys for watching. Uh, inshallah, this video will come out early for the Patreon. If you like the video, like, share, and subscribe. And click the bell icon uh, to, to stay notified. notified. And if you want to support this channel, uh, then please consider becoming a Patreon. Uh, that would help me a great deal. And uh, yeah, with this, I want to end the video. Thank you guys for watching. This is a good luck. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.